This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Your brothers and sisters in Christ gathered at the empty tomb of our Savior, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. When the first shots were fired on Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor, crowds cheered. When war was declared between two similar parts of the same nation, people threw parties and rejoiced as they sent their brave boys off to war. Oh, the mighty United States Army is going to crush that Southern Rebellion in just a matter of weeks. The Confederate Army will, will ensure our state's rights, our Southern states, the rights of our Southern states, in just a matter of months. Everyone thought the war was going to be over in maybe a year. Heroes were going to be made. Heroic songs, songs of gallantry and glory were going to be written. When a battle ensued outside of Washington, D.C., near a muddy creek called Bull Run, people came out in their finest for an afternoon picnic to watch our brave soldiers crush this silly rebellion. But they were all horribly wrong. It didn't take long before those very same citizens were fleeing for their lives as the Union <clears throat> Army made a chaotic retreat from that muddy creek. Soon cheering on both sides turned into mourning. The gallantry and glory that everyone had envisioned soon turned to darkness and bloodshed. And casualty lists and death on fields of battle like Antietam Creek in Maryland where over 22,000 men were killed in the single bloodiest day in American history. Or at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania where over 50,000 men were killed in three days or at Cold Harbor, Virginia, where over 7,000 Union soldiers were killed in less than an hour. By the end of the war, things had gotten so bad that the soldiers, the armies, were starting to dig trenches to protect themselves, not unlike the armies would do during World War I. <coughs> One year soon, soon turned into two, three, four years. For four years, the Confederate and Union armies fought back at each other, track, traded blow after blow against one another. General Robert E. Lee and his Confederate Army of, the Northern, of Northern Virginia brilliantly outmaneuvered many a general, but neither his army nor the Confederacy could withstand the relentless pounding of the Union Army under General Ulysses S. Grant. Finally, on Palm Sunday, April 9, 1865, 150 years ago this week, Lee and his army found themselves surrounded on all sides with no way of escape, and the only reasonable action was to surrender. So the two generals met at Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia, where Lee and his army formally surrendered, signaling the end of that awful civil war. That war had taken so many lives, between 640,000 and 700,000 lives, by some accounts, Two and a half percent of the entire American population. That would be like seven million people today. And it was finally over. The battles, the shooting, the bloodshed, the horrors of war were finally over. Just as Confederate armies and cities and government officials surrendered. All of it could finally stop. Now, if you think about it in Union states like New York, towns and villages like our own, when that news that the war was over, that victory was won, got there, you can imagine how excited people got. People were so excited. The war is over. Victory is won. Church bells pealed all across the nation. Parades were planned. The Grand Army of the Republic was going to march down this down Main Street in Washington, D.C., in triumphal march. But most importantly, the nation and her families would be reunited. After all, President Lincoln had promised a merciful and peaceful reunion of both the North and the South back into one nation. Victory was certain. But it had come at a tremendous cost. Our 
first parents, Adam and Eve, made a horrible, horrible mistake when they ignited a civil war with the holy God in the Garden of Eden. God had given them a single command. They could eat from any tree in the garden, just not that one. Leave that one for me, he told them. But instead, they had followed along with Satan's temptation and willingly and foolishly disobeyed what God had said. They didn't realize what was coming by what they did. They figured, it's all going to be glorious. We're going to be like God anyway. Instead of thinking only of themselves, they ushered into our world glorious things like shame <laughs> and conflict and guilt. Their glory or what they envisioned would be glorious turned into mourning as God handed down the consequences, the very serious consequences for their sin. Their glory turned into pain and toil, suffering and death. The great divide of sin tore apart the perfect unity that had been there between God and and people. They hoped it would be over soon, but it was just the beginning. The casualty count since then is beyond count. All the pain, all the guilt, all the conflict and shame, all the blame and pain and suffering, and of course, death. Death came to Adam and Eve, and every son and daughter descended from Adam and Eve. The pages of history are littered with the effects and results of death from the most powerful, mightiest ruler to the poorest beggar. Death has broken into every home and touched every life. It doesn't care about your social status. It doesn't care about your race, your gender, your religion. It takes us all. It robs each and every victim of every earthly possession. Whatever, whenever death passes by, it always leaves behind grief and sorrow and pain and tears. It steals away for all eternity the opportunity for the unbeliever to come to faith and causes pain for even the strongest Christian. Death's unrelenting attack against humanity, against humanity has lasted for centuries. All because its source, sin, infects us all. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. Like a poisonous snake hunting down its victim and, and causing tremendous suffering and death, death causes tremendous suffering and destruction for all of us. Because all of us have sinned, and there's nothing we can do. No matter, you know, for all the brilliant maneuvers against disease that have been made, we still haven't been able to won't be able to stop death. Because death is God's relentless punishment for sin. So if death is so awful, so terrifying, so dangerous, why is it that when we look at 1 Corinthians 15, we find Paul taunting death? Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Knowing what death has done to our first parents and our loved ones and our friends and those before us, knowing what death will do to us and our descendants, you'd almost think Paul was out of his mind. How could you taunt death? But Paul was perfectly sane. Paul knew exactly what he was saying. So, so why was he taunting death? Paul knew that no matter how bad the battles against death might be, or will be, or have been, he knew that the victory was already won. Not by people like us, not even by great heroes of faith, but by a sinless Savior promised long ago. That Savior would reunite God and us once and for all by winning the victory over death at a tremendous cost cost of his own life. So as the bad news of the world's first civil war came rolling in, the Lord in his gracious mercy paused to make a promise of peace. Unconditional love that would one day be fulfilled. He spoke to Satan, his enemy who had first tempted Adam and Eve to fall into that sin, and the Lord promised, I will put enmity, hostility between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. 
Guess what? Say, you ignited this civil war between me and mankind. Well, guess what? I'm coming after you. I'm going to end this war so decisively that you and all the forces of hell are going to have to unconditionally surrender. Satan did his best to, to keep that, that civil war between God and humanity going. Pain, shame, guilt, conflict, war, bloodshed, death. But then Jesus came along. Satan tried to stop Jesus with temptation, so Jesus lived a perfect life. Satan tried to oppose Jesus with clever arguments, so Jesus proclaimed the word of truth. Then Satan got his champion, undefeated, his champion, death, to oppose Jesus. Then on Good Friday, it really looked like death had won. After all, Jesus had suffered tremendously for the sins of the world. He had agonized there on the cross for hours. And eventually he did bow his head and die. It seemed like Jesus had died just like every other human being. It seemed like death had won just like every other time. Maybe you can imagine, uh, you almost wonder if there was great joy in hell that day. Yeah, victory's ours, death reigns, woo! But they made a foolish mistake. Yes, Jesus lost the battle, but won the war. In the process of allowing his life to be taken, his blood to be shed, himself to be sacrificed for our sins, Jesus yanked those fangs right out of the serpent. He took the sting away from death. So death couldn't hold him. Death couldn't contain him. Yes, his dead corpse was placed into a tomb, but three days later, that tomb was empty. Completely empty. That, that tomb, you know, Jesus... After three days, because that tomb stood empty, Jesus' disciples, they, they were so happy that they found out that day that Jesus was alive. Death was swallowed up in the emptiness of Jesus' tomb. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. By swallowing up death, by removing its sting, Jesus forced Satan to surrender unconditionally. In doing so, Jesus fulfilled that promise made so long ago and reunited the Holy God with you and me, with His beloved humanity. So by His death and resurrection, Jesus brings you and me back to God. Because Christ is risen. He is risen to me. The unbridled joy of that Union victory after, after four grueling years of civil war it lasted all of about two weeks. An assassin's bullet took out the president who had promised, with malice toward none, let us strive to bind up the nation's wounds and achieve a just and lasting peace. Reconstruction of the nation would come, but that healing that was promised with such hope and joy never materialized in the years that followed. That's what happens with human victories. They promise so much about what's going to happen in the future, but rarely, if ever, do they actually come through on those promises. They almost always fall short, and often fall short horrendously. So what about Jesus' victory over death on that Easter Sunday 2,000 years ago? After all, you'd say, well, yeah, okay, Jesus lives, great, but you know, we st I still feel the sting of death. I still lose, lose loved ones. I still grieve and weep and mourn. I still, that all happens to me. I still have to stand at the deathbed or the open grave of a loved one. I still have to deal with the pain of this life and face the reality of my own death. So did Jesus' victory over death fall short too, just like so many other human victories throughout history? Listen again to St. Paul. The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul doesn't deny that we feel death sting. He himself knew it. He was familiar with it. But that does not mean that death gets the final victory. Yes, death may turn us back to dust. But victory is ours through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is risen. He is risen through Jesus, you now have new life. You are a new creation in Him. If you're troubled by the guilt of your sins, past 
or present, well, you have mercy and forgiveness guaranteed by Christ's victory over death. If you're troubled by your health or with your job or trouble with your family or something else that's keeping you up at night, you have Jesus' protection and promise guaranteed in His victory over death. If you worry about being abandoned or rejected or lonely, you can be sure that Jesus guarantees that He will never leave you or forsake you, that He will be with you always because He conquered death, because He won the victory over death and left His tomb empty. If you're troubled by temptation, find strength in the Savior who conquered sin so that you can serve your Lord and others. <coughs> Grateful thanks for what for Christ's victory won for you. If you're troubled by grief, or if the fear of death grips you, find comfort in Jesus, who guarantees by His empty tomb that eternal life is yours. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. In the end, Jesus guarantees that His victory will be yours. A day will come when the grief and the sorrow, the tears and the fears will be no more. One day you will receive a life that never ends. A life in joy in the presence of your living Savior for all eternity. You can be sure that you will see Him with your own eyes. Those loved ones in the Lord, those fellow believers who have gone before you, He'll be there with them too. And if you're not so sure about that, Paul explains that to us too as he looks ahead to the last day. When not only will, we be, will our souls be in heaven, but our bodies raised to new life will join us, join our souls there in the glories of heaven. We will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. On that last day, death will be able to do nothing else than surrender. Because Jesus is going to make your tomb empty as well. Because Christ is risen. He is risen to me. 150 years ago this week, a horrible civil war came to a joyful end. There was great celebration. Looking back now, you can see a lot of good and a lot of bad that came out of that victory. But that's the way it is with human victories since the dawn of time. On this holy day, you also can celebrate the end of a civil war. In fact, you could celebrate that end of the Civil War, that, that victory every single day. Lasting victory is yours, and yours now, through your Savior Jesus Christ. So celebrate. Celebrate, because Jesus' tomb is empty, and yours will be too. Celebrate, because death has been defeated for you once and for all. Celebrate, because Jesus lives, you will also. Celebrate, because Jesus has reunited you with the God who loves you, and sent Him to save you. Celebrate, because victory is ours, eternal victory, through our Lord Jesus Christ. My friends, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen.